thanks for staying awake so far. I'd like to introduce you to a future of a world that is more sustainable, kinder to animals, and kinder to the environment that we've experienced so far. I'd like to invite you to a future where climate change catastrophe has been avoided just at the very last time, where climate anxiety is widespread and well-known, but also decreasing again, because it's no longer necessary. I want to introduce a future in which the eating of meat and dairy has become taboo, where we find it very old-fashioned when we would think back of the amount of cheese that we Dutchies like to eat per day. And this is a future that is not so far away. This is a future that you and I are going to still live in. It's a future that we will use to tell stories to our children and grandchildren about the decisions that we are making now. But before we can go to such a future, I think we need to understand what drives radical societal change, because that is what we're talking about, right? And I'm guessing that the answers that may pop up in your mind are not the answers that accord with the research about what drives history. So perhaps you were thinking politics or the law, or perhaps you were thinking finances, big corporates, or perhaps you were thinking in order for radical societal change to occur, what we need is a massive agreement of the whole population on a certain matter. And in reality, what research shows is that the answers are much more humble than that. Basically, you need only two things. You need, firstly, a relatively small group of people, I'm talking 3 to 10 percent of a full population, who firmly believe that change is needed and who dare to believe that change is possible also. See, when I was a toddler, my grandparents would come over to visit me for birthday parties, for example, and they would smoke in the living room. And so did my aunts and my uncles and my parents. And it was no problem, just as it was fine when I was a teenager to smoke in a train or in a car. Nowadays, we all know that if you dare to light a cigarette in the lavatory of an airplane, you'll be fine, big time. And more than that, smoking in public spaces, especially when there's children around, is now perceived as something you just don't do. We're now convinced that it's unhealthy and perhaps even dangerous. So what happened in this relatively short time span? A small group of people, activists and health experts, had been able to change our minds, our ideas, not just about what was healthy, but also about what was desirable and attractive and sexy, even. That is how radical societal change occurs. And let me give you some more examples. Three centuries ago, we were still burning witches. And before that time, we did not think that this was something inhumane. The opposite is true. We thought that we had to do that in order to protect our children, to protect our society from bad influences. And nowadays, obviously, it would be very hard to explain to our children, or even to ourselves, that at one point in history, we thought it was okay to burn people because we thought that their behavior was weird. 150 years ago, slavery became illegal by law in nearly every country around the world. Slavery was an economic system, and one that was so vague that it was always said that it was impossible to bend. Because if we would do that, we would wreck the economy and civilization with that. 
And then a relatively small group of people spread another idea. And these ideas seem to spread like TED Talks do. And nowadays, I think all of us would agree that we feel embarrassed just looking back at this part of history. A hundred years ago, women in the Netherlands received the right to vote. And unlike slaves, women were not seen as non-humans. They were seen as humans, just not as very rational ones. Not as storytellers you should listen to. And look at us now. Look at me now. What changes society, what changes behavior, is not material circumstances. And it's not the opportunities that the majority or the most powerful see. It's a shifting culture. You and I, we're part of a generation that is finding itself in equally, perhaps still unthinkable, but exciting historical times. We're part of a generation in which we might experience anytime soon that it will become very hard or expensive to still buy meat and dairy. And the reason is that more and more scientists agree that the meat and dairy industry are incredibly polluting. And they create an enormous amount of carbon emissions, and we all know that carbon emissions are associated with climate changes. And so, the most effective thing to do, if we want to counter climate change catastrophe, is to change our diet, is to start eating way less meat and dairy. And this warning of so many scientists is even more pressing if we consider the fact that we're now with seven and a half billion people, and in 2030, we'll have nine billion people walking around here. And if these all insist on continuing to eat as we do now, then we'll find ourselves in deep problems and deep water. So obviously, change is needed, and change is also occurring. At this very moment, the vegan movement is one of the fastest growing social movements worldwide. And most of the members are youngsters. They are the ones deciding on our future habits. They are the ones deciding what will be the norm in 10 years from now. What will, what will be considered civilized and smart and normal. So, I'm an anthropologist of the future, and that means that I do research on what is already occurring and try to understand how likely it is that that will occur on a larger scale anytime soon. And when I was doing research for my book, We Used to Eat Animals, I found that there are tens of farmers, probably way more, worldwide, who already sold or given away their livestock to sanctuaries and now plant legumes or make cheese out of nuts. I tasted beef that was made from beets. I found that seaweed is the new hot thing in agribusiness because it's stacked with proteins, but it doesn't have that big of a footprint. I found that more and more meat is made in labs, not from animals, but from blood cells from animals. So we need less animals in order to feed the same amount of people. I overheard youngsters saying that they were lying awake at night, anxious because of the climate. I saw young people protesting the streets. I also overheard a strategic manager of a well-known fast food chain saying that in 15 years from now, all of their burgers will be plant-based. I saw holograms telling you how healthy your food is, and other holograms telling you how destructive your food had been for the environment. So, perhaps this still seems far away, but I hope that after this talk, what remains with you is the idea that we don't need the majority 
of people in order for change to occur. You need a ripple effect. You don't need a lot of resources or political power. You need a small group of people with a firm belief. And once we honestly, honestly thought that smoking cigarettes was healthy, we thought that it was perfectly fine to burn so-called witches. We thought that men could rule the world. And sooner or later, we'll probably remind ourselves that once we ate animals. Thank you.